Hello, folks, and welcome to the QLab 5 introductory live stream, the second of two introductory live streams, to be precise. Welcome from wherever you are. I am in New York, where it is sunny and lovely in the afternoon. And uh, but of course, it's a little cloudy today, so light might change throughout the day. We're trying a natural lighting effect today. We'll see how it goes. In any case, my name is Sam Kuznets, and I work with Figure 53 helping to make QLab. I do the graphic design for QLab, uh, some of it, and some what we call feature design. I also work on the QLab manual. And I'm seeing in the chat that someone says, no sound. Stand by. Am I more audible now? Would we, uh, in the chat, agree collectively that this is a relatively good level? Or is it still under? Uh-huh, uh-huh, everyone says much better. OK, great. See, welcome to live broadcast on the internet. My name is Sam, and I work primarily in live theater, where if you're too quiet, you simply need to talk louder. Thank you all for your assistance. Uh, I'm looking over here, by the way. This way, in my field of view, is the chat. So if you see me kind of stealing furtive glances, I'm simply looking at the chat. Um, I'm going to take it once again. My name is Sam Kuznets. I work for Figure 53, helping to make QLab. I do graphic design and feature design for QLab, which means not only how it looks, but how it works. And uh, I sort of serve as a consultant in-house because I work in live theater using QLab all the time. Additionally, I write the manual for QLab and I teach QLab classes and do live stream events like this one. Um, today, I'm going to show you briefly a few highlights of what's new in QLab 5, um, things that I think are particularly noteworthy for QLab 4 users. And uh, the main purpose of today is to do question and answer with all of you. So I'll blow through my introductory material, but if any questions come up as I'm speaking, please feel free to ask them in the chat and I will clock them by glancing off this way and answer them as I go. If there are any stream problems or audio problems as you just uh, help me with, please again, use the chat to let me know. And then finally, um, uh, don't, don't, please don't hold your questions for the end. There's plenty of time for questions at the end, but go ahead and ask a question any old time and I will answer it or attempt to answer it when I think is the right moment. Um, so without further ado, let me show you QLab. What we're doing here is, um, uh, so I've, I've got QLab running on an external monitor to my Mac, the workspace window is this left window here on the left, and audition output window is here on the right, so you're seeing the video output from QLab uh, as though it were going to, say, a projector on a wall behind me or something like that. Uh, and then I'm down here in the corner so that you know uh, what's going on. Um, alrighty, and I have QLab set to audition, so sort of skipping ahead to a complicated topic from the beginning. Audition means play, into this window here on screen instead of to an output like a projector or a wall or a video wall or a screen. Um, but this is just so that I can show you what QLab is doing and use QLab as a sort of uh, presentation, uh, presentation software. So here we go. Um, right off the bat, we have a question from Matt Reynolds Designs. Is the video engine better able to render H.264 MP4 files without jitter? The short answer is yes. The long answer is H.264 is still a lousy file format for live presentation, and I encourage you not to use it. Um, there's sort of a twofer going on here. One is that the uh, QLab 5 does a better job rendering video, period. Two is that most modern Macs now have um, hardware decoding built in for a lot of video file types, including H.264 and H.265. Um, but all that notwithstanding, I will uh, discuss this at whatever length the chat suggests I should, I still recommend avoiding H.264 files just the same way I recommend avoiding MP3s for audio playback. On the one hand, there's nothing wrong with them, and on the other hand, they're dreadful and everything is wrong with them. 
And so it's my recommendation that you use ProRes 422 proxy for video and AIFF or WAVE for audio. But we'll talk more about that in depth over time. Um, okay, what's new in QLab? I'm breaking it down into a couple of key areas and we can sort of talk about each one bit by bit. Again, please ask questions at any time. If it's relevant exactly to what I'm saying, great. If it's not exactly relevant to what I'm saying, no problem. I might hold your question until later um, or I might jump in anytime. First, we have a new video engine in QLab 5. I'm gonna talk about that with some detail. We have a new patching infrastructure, which sort of um, reaches all over QLab and can help a variety of different workflows. We have some quality of life improvements, as I call them. We have some new queuing options and tools. We have a completely redesigned and rethought audition mode. And then we have some major changes to networking and collaboration. So we'll talk about these things in this order. We'll start with the video engine. Um, the video engine in QLab 5 has been rebuilt from scratch using Metal, which is Apple's newer um, low-level video framework. It's designed to give the best possible performance, especially on Apple Silicon hardware, and it really does deliver. The performance in QLab 5, um, particularly on Apple Silicon, is better than the same video playback setup in QLab 4 on the same Mac. So an apples to apples comparison will show you better performance, even though QLab 5 does some more elaborate stuff. Um, that more elaborate stuff includes per queue blend modes. So blend modes, for those of you who don't know what they are, uh, involve uh, are sort of a, um, a way of combining an image with the image behind it. So here we have two text cues, ooh and ah, which use different blend modes to combine their pixels with the pixels of the image of the queue list that's uh, behind them. Um, QLab has a bunch of built-in blend modes that you see in the list here on screen. Um, there's also a blend mode section of the manual and a blend modes tutorial to download so that you can explore. Critical for um, your own logic, uh, queues blend downwards only. So the blend mode of a queue only affects the way that it combines with queues on lower layer numbers. We have a question in the sink from uh, in the sink, a question in the chat from Alex Pickup. Would you be able to walk me through the best way to run a main and backup in sync or through hardware or in software just for audio playback? The answer is yes, I'd be happy to do that. I'm going to wait till the end of this section to talk about it. But yes, we can talk about that shortly. Okay, blend modes. Also, cues in QLab support multiple video effects. So previously, you could have a single video effect on a queue in QLab. You can now have multiple video effects, and they render in order. So here, the zoom blur is applied first, and then the Gabor gradients are applied next. It, that means that you have a blurred image that gets the gradient effect applied to it. If you reverse the order and had the gradients first and then zoom blur, you'd have the gradients applied and then the resulting image there would be zoom blurred. So the order matters and um, you can turn them on and off individually by checking the boxes and you can reorder them just by dragging and dropping. We've added NDI input and output to QLab. So QLab previously could uh, output video to any directly connected screen available to the Mac OS. It could also output to any Decklink hardware made by Blackmagic Designs, and then could also output to Siphon, which is an inter-application video framework. Now we have NDI added to that, so QLab can send video over a local network or over any network uh, connection that NDI video is supported upon. NDI inputs also means we have some fun things like um, I'm running a program called NDI Camera on my phone, uh, the phone is connected by Wi-Fi to the same network that my laptop is on. And as a result, when I fade in this camera cue, you see my face live from this camera. And as you can see, the latency is not zero, but it's not terrible. So NDI is very, um, it's a very powerful addition. Um, NDI itself is a little odd, and we're still working out a couple of the more subtle kinks, but um, 
it is functional and it is stable and it is uh, cool. Eric Rosales asks, thrilled with the implementation of NDI audio, is there a way to output the sound from a sound cue to an NDI output so that I could use, let's say, NDI as a virtual sound card? QLab itself is uh, focused on video through NDI. So um, what is possible though, is to install the NDI tools from NewTek's website, ndi.tv. And the NDI tools create a, uh, a virtual NDI audio output device, which acts like Dante Virtual Sound Card. So while QLab doesn't speak directly to NDI in an audio only way, QLab does see the virtual NDI audio device as just another audio device installed on your Mac. So hopefully that answers your question, Eric. Um, please let me know if you have any follow-up to that question. Um, NDI, that I just demonstrated with my iPhone, NDI coming in uh, from, uh, NDI video coming into QLab, but NDI can also go out from QLab. You can define an NDI outputs own um, dimensions, frame rate, and the number of audio channels, uh, I believe up to 16, which is the limit built into the NDI, the version of NDI that QLab uses. I could be wrong about that. Um, but um, you define that in QLab and then QLab publishes that NDI output available for any NDI receiving stuff on your local network. Related to this, although not directly, not only related to this, camera cues now have a built-in mic cue. So if you have a camera source and an associated audio source that you would like to come up live when your camera source comes live in QLab, you can arrange that here. The IO tab, which is new in QLab 5, lets you specify the video input and audio input of a camera cue separately. And everything you can do in a mic cue, you can now do in a camera cue. When you're using an NDI source for a camera cue, right now there's a limitation in QLab where only that NDI source's audio can be used as the audio source for that video cue, for that camera cue. Um, we're going to work on that over time and hopefully develop some other tools around NDI coming and going with and without audio. But for now, when you use an NDI source, you use its audio and video together or you use other sources and you can use them separately. The patching infrastructure of QLab. Um, what you're looking at here is the uh, audio outputs tab of audio workspace settings. Previously, QLab workspaces had eight audio output patches. You could assign your cues to any of those eight patches, and those eight patches could be assigned to any audio interface attached to your Mac or a virtual audio interface, such as Dante Virtual Sound Card. But in QLab 5, you have an arbitrary number of patches, an infinite number of patches, as many patches as you want. Each patch can be named, patches can be reordered, patches can be copied and pasted, they can be copy and pasted between workspaces, they can even be selected in a workspace and drag and drop into the folder to create a settings file, which can then be dragged and dropped into a workspace and re-imported that way. Um, each patch can be assigned to only one audio device, but multiple patches can use the same audio device and with different routing. So you could have audio patch one sending all of your cues audio to Dante Virtual Sound Card out all the outputs available to your sound system, but then patch two could also go to Dante Virtual Sound Card, but might route your cue outputs only to a pair of headphones uh, sitting on your desk with a Dante-capable headphone amplifier or something like that. So patch flexibility has been dramatically increased. Also, sound uh, audio cues and mic cues now use the same set of audio outputs. Audio inputs for mic cues are entirely separate. And this multiple patch structure, the same sort of interface and the same behavior applies to audio outputs, audio inputs, network uh, patches, MIDI patches, and I think that that's it. Um, those are my notes. Okay, great. Quality of life improvements. Um, for those who use carts, 
We have uh, made the grid size of carts now more flexible. Instead of a fixed number of grid layouts, we have a uh, control to allow you to set any cart from one by one up to 10 by 10. Oh, I've, I've moved on too quickly. Chris Holder asks, Audinate Dante integration. Um, QLab does not have Dante built in directly. QLab supports Dante Virtual Sound Card as an output uh, device. So if you install DVS on your Mac, you get a solid low latency 64 by 64 channel um, audio interface over your network. Um, Audinate Dante integration is something we've been asked about a few times, but not many times. If there's anyone out there who has a description of how directly integrating Audinate would make a difference um, for you in practical use, I'd love to know about it. Um, our email address is support at figure53.com and we welcome emails uh, at all times on any topic. Um, okay, cart quality of life improvement. So you can make the grid, you can make a cart one by one, which is just a single button, or you can make it up to 10 by 10. Um, individual cart buttons show more information. For instance, you see here, Cheer Up Hamlet is showing both its pre-wait countdown, minus three seconds to go, when we hit go on that cue, it would go three, two, one, zero, and then start playing. And then also the display size uh, of the cue list, which has existed for many versions of Q Lab. You can make them small, medium, or large. We also now have an analogous control for cue cart buttons, small, medium, and large. Um, Poser Racer asks, do we have an option to export the settings individually or as a whole setting of a workspace? Uh, I'm opening the workspace settings window now and I'll show you what's possible. I can export with this button here and I get a full list. And this is all the settings in the workspace. You can create a custom set of settings. So I could say, I would like to export my workspace mini controls, my collaboration settings, my audio outputs and inputs, and my light patch and export a settings file with exactly those settings. And when I do that, let's put them in here, put them in this folder. When I do that, the settings file will be titled with the name of my workspace, then settings, and then the number of categories of settings I put in, so five items. If I then want to import that workspace, I could make a new, um, I'm sorry, not import that workspace, import those settings. I could make a new workspace, open the workspace settings for that new workspace, choose import, and I could import from that settings file. I could import from another open workspace, or I could import from defaults. So I'll choose from settings file, choose that five items settings file we just created, and when I do that, QLab opens up that same sheet, but here any available checkbox shows, uh, sorry, any checkbox for a setting that is in the settings file, the ones we created were workspace, MIDI, collaboration, audio inputs and outputs and light patch, those are available for me to check and I could import just the ones I want or I could import all the settings that are available in the workspace uh, settings file. And there we go. So workspace settings coming and going are now much, much, much more flexible and hopefully much more useful. Um, Okie dokie, back to quality of life improvements. So that's carts. We also now have live AU meters in audio effects. Um, but before I go on, because of the lag of YouTube, uh, you know, I can either pause awkwardly for a while and see if there are relevant questions, or I can sort of plow on, and I've chosen to plow on because I'm a jumpy, talkative individual. Uh, but now I'll go back. Greg Leeper asks, how does this export compare to using templates? Um, they're different things. You can export your workspace settings and import them. You can create a workspace full of a bunch of settings that you like and use that as a workspace template, whatever makes you happy, or in whatever combination you like. They are two means to an end. They are much like any other um, banner feature of QLab, like group queues. The idea here is we don't know how you're going to work. We don't know what's going to be important to you. And you might not know in advance what you need. 
But as time goes on, you may find a pattern of behavior that works for you in one case, but another pattern of behavior that works for you in another case. We just try to leave the door open to whatever uh, workflow ends up suiting your needs. Okay, back to live meters and audio cue effects. Previously, in QLab 4, an audio effect inserted on a cue output or a device output would have live meters, but an audio effect inserted on an audio cue, the meters would not be live. We worked it out. Chris Ashworth did a sneaky thing. He figured it out. It is now possible. Negative load, you may already have used this tool. When you load to time using Command T or uh, load to time tool under the tool menu, tools menu, you can load a queue to time. You may have also already known that you can load a queue back from the end of its duration. So I can say load to negative five and it will load me back five seconds from the end of a queue with a specific duration. You can now use those negative times in load queues and in OSC messages that refer to loading. Just a small, small improvement. We also have new lighting definitions from new friends. Um, this list from Acme through Yellow River are, um, are manufacturers whose lights have not yet appeared in QLab's built-in light lighting library. Uh, now they have. And then the lower list, Altman through Yorkville, those are folks whose lights already appear in QLab, but we added more lights. So there are now about 1,400 fixtures. This slide is out of date. About 1,400 fixtures defined in QLab's um, light library, and we're adding more all the time as requests come in. Before I move on, I'll catch uh, Eric's question. Is there a way to switch what page QLab remote is on from QLab so that the technician slash actor gets a new surface according to where the show is would be great for cart pages. Um, that doesn't exist yet. Um, QLab 5, QLab remote 5 exists and can do all the things that QLab remote used to be able to do. It's also up to date with some of the new features in, in QLab 5. Um, right now, there is no way to remote control QLab remote. QLab remote is itself a remote control. Um, another quality of life improvement uh, is a pair of features, autosave and snapshot. So autosave is what it sounds like. Um, QLab automatically saves while you're working according to an interval that you define. So you go to the QLab menu, QLab preferences, autosave, and you can choose a number here anywhere between five seconds and 600 seconds, which is 10 minutes. If that, uh, number is set, and if the workspace is set to autosave, which they all are by default, then while you're making cues or making edits to your workspace, whenever you stop, a timer starts. And when it reaches that threshold, let's say my workspace is five seconds, after five seconds of inactivity, QLab updates an autosave file. There's a, an upper limit, 10 minutes. Even if I'm working continuously for 10 minutes, um, QLab will only delay the autosave a maximum of 10 minutes. So even if I work continuously for an hour, it'll still autosave every 10 minutes, even at the risk of the save interrupting me with what I'm doing. Um, autosave is turned on and off in general, file management, autosave. If this is unchecked, QLab 5 behaves just like QLab 4 with no autosaving. If this is checked, which we encourage, then anytime you make changes and then stop, it will wait the autosave duration and then make an autosave copy. Additionally, snapshots exist. A snapshot is, up, is created every time you save, except that when you save, the workspace saves with the changes you made. The snapshot saves a copy of the workspace from before all the changes you made. So just to be clear, let's say I open my show at 5.02 a.m., 9.02 a.m., excuse me. I work on making changes until 10.15, and then I manually command S, save. At that moment, my workspace contains the 10.15 a.m. version of my file, of my cues. But QLab makes a snapshot, which is the 9.02 a.m. version. When I save again at 11.30, 
I now have a snapshot that reflects the 10.15 a.m. version. Every time I save, QLab both saves the main file the way I just saved it, but also saves a snapshot from the last state of the workspace. This makes it easy for you to go back to a previous version. For example, as I'm sure many of you have experienced, you start a rehearsal process and the director comes in and one morning and says, all right, I want to try this big different thing. Let's try this. So you make a bunch of changes and then half an hour later, after all that work, the director says, nope, nope, this is all bad. Let's go back to the version we were doing yesterday. This is designed to help you do that. Okie dokie. The next quality of life improvement is uh, warnings. Um, a lot of work has been done on warnings. Levi Manners asked, if auto, if auto save is on, does it also make snapshots or does it overwrite the original? And Matt Reynolds asks, do each of the auto save at snapshots remain or are they overwritten? Basically the same question. Here's how it works. This folder shows my um, workspace. I'm gonna clear the clutter. This is the workspace you're all looking at. And here's a backups folder. In that backups folder is a single autosave folder, which is constantly updated. And then each snapshot file is distinct and individual. So I hit save today at 141, 143, 150, right? So the snapshots remain. The autosave is a constantly updated, most recent version. Okay, warnings. So, um, you may or may not be familiar with the workspace status window, but the workspace status window warnings tab shows any queue that is broken or misbehaving in QLab 4. In QLab 5, it also shows some more elaborate warnings. So um, any, um, for instance, here in this, in this screenshot, here's a MIDI patch that has a uh, problem and it causes one other warning, which is it causes this broken queue. This queue is broken, we knew that before, but now we know why it's broken. It's broken because it's assigned to a patch and the patch is missing from the workspace. So this uh, warnings tab hopefully gives you a much more detailed way to explore what's broken in your workspace and how to fix it. When a broken queue is selected, I'll, here, I'll create a queue that's broken. This broken queue is selected, untitled audio queue. What's wrong with it? No audio file. Detail, select an audio file as the target. So it gives you a little bit of a clue. If you click inspect queue, it opens, it selects that queue and opens the inspector to the part of the inspector where you can fix the problem. Here's another broken queue. What's wrong? Or another broken, another warning, I, I beg your pardon. Camera patch, SAM phone is disconnected because I switched off my cell phone, which had the NDI camera. Uh, if I unfold this broken, this, this warning, I see that it causes a broken queue, which is the uh, camera queue that showed my phone. The camera queue now knows it's broken because it can't play any video. It can't play any video because its input patch is missing its input device. If you select the patch warning, the button becomes a shortcut to open to opening the appropriate part of QLab's uh, workspace settings window. If you select the queue, the button becomes the inspect queue button, which lets me inspect that queue. In any case, open help allows you, uh, when you click open help, it opens a web browser and links to the appropriate part of QLab's documentation so that you can um, read up on whatever issue you're currently facing. Needless to say, that button only works if your Mac is online because uh, that's where the manual is. Okay. The right click menu is something that exists in QLab now. When you right click on either a queue or a control within the inspector, the right click menu gives you a few shortcuts. You can edit the selected queue or queues. You can preview, load, panic. Uh, the queue, you can open that queue in a new inspector window. You can paste queue properties if you've copied them. It's the same thing as Command Shift V. You can also get help. And each of these panels of help 
that shows up under the help menu uh, is a context sensitive section of information about whatever you've clicked on. If you want that panel to stick around, you can click the pop out button and that little panel will appear in its own tiny window so that you can look at it and keep it in mind as you work around. Each of those panels also has an online documentation button, which again, jumps to the relevant section of the manual in the online uh, documentation. Down here in the inspector, the help varies depending upon what you're selecting. So here I selected pre-weight. I have a little information about pre-weight and then I have a little information about editing durations overall. Here I selected name, Q name. So here I have a section on Q name and here is a section on editing text in general. Something we're really excited about and we put a lot of work into. Um, so we're hoping that you'll get a lot out of it. Another quality of life change, linear fade curves exist now. You can create sharp cornered curves uh, rather than the smoothed um, Bezier curves that QLab 4 gives you. Those are still available, of course, but now sharp corners are available and they're available in integrated fade curves as well. So previously a sharp, a one little dip to notch out a moment in a sound cue used to take uh, six little control points to make sharp corners now would take only three. Um, arrow keys let you move between selected points. Option arrow keys and option shift arrow keys let you move the selected point with your keyboard if that's, uh, if that's your style. Some folks like to keep their hands on the keyboard as much as possible and avoid the mouse. So here we are with this audio cue. I've selected on one dot and I'm using the arrow keys to move left and right between the dots. And I hold down option and left and right or up and down moves the dot and option shift and arrow keys move the dot also, but in smaller chunks. Eric asks, is there a master level in audio patch that can be controlled via OSC or MIDI that affects the sound, all sound channels across the board? No, there is not. And we believe that that is a safety issue. Um, it is our opinion that being able to remote control the main level of QLab opens the door to an accidental adjustment of that level that is difficult to predict um, what it will do. If you have a loud sound and you accidentally nudge the level, or no, let's do it this way. Let's say you've lowered your main audio level via a MIDI controller or a knob, and then you want to set a loud cue you said it louder and louder and louder, but then later you realize, oh, I had the level down. Let me pop it back up to where it belongs. Now that loud cue is extraordinarily loud and you can hurt people. So for us, um, if you need physical control over the output level of QLab, our strong recommendation is to use a physical console or mixer or an audio device that has its own dedicated hardware remote. We think it is a, a, a safety issue and we are not interested in adding um, any kind of remote control to the overall level of QLab unless we can overcome that safety issue. And that's something that our investigations continue upon. Uh, Carl Asmussen asks, does the right, clip, right click help window pop up if you click on the top bar with all the different cues? We have no right click up here. We do have a mouse over here, which gives you the name of the queue if you point and hover. And the documentation does give you a lot of information on those queue types. But our feeling is that uh, the right click menu should appear only where you can do something with it proactive, not just popping up help. Um, it could be interesting to add a help only menu up here, but that's something for the future. If that seems like it would be useful to you, please write in and tell us about it. Um, Cause I think that that could be cool. Um, all right, time code and time code capture. Um, cues uh, can be triggered by time code in QLab. That was always true. Um, but what's new is a capture button. So if you have incoming time code and you want to wait for the perfect moment and then click go, QLab can capture the incoming time code at that moment as the trigger for that cue. We also have uh, AppleScript and OSC commands to capture time code. So I could put this 
OSC queue, this network queue with this OSC message on a hotkey. And it would say, whenever I hit that hotkey, the selected queue gets the current incoming timecode as its timecode trigger. Um, I will be shortly, um, next couple of weeks, releasing uh, and adding to the manual a timecode tools tutorial, which will talk about all the ways to work with timecode. We also, in QLab 5 now, chase uh, and sync to timecode. So if you've selected a queue list, turning on timecode for that list allows queues, which are triggered from timecode in that list, to track incoming timecode. If the incoming timecode skips ahead, the queues that were started by timecode will skip ahead. If timecode starts later in the stream than QLab is expecting, queues will load to that time and then start only queues which are triggered by timecode. You can also optionally have QLab pause or stop timecode triggered queues when incoming timecode pauses or stops. Or you can have QLab do nothing, which is the V4 behavior. You can enter an optional freewheel time between zero and two seconds. And the rest of timecode is the same as before. The file target search tool is another quality of life tool. If you have an audio cue whose, um, whose target is missing, oh, it looks like I accidentally fixed this cue when no one was looking. So if I get rid of that cue, and now I'm gonna sneakily put, mm, well, if I get rid of that cue, it now has a missing target. If I go to the tools menu while that queue is selected, I'm sorry, it's not working right now. Oh, I see what I've done. All right. I've accidentally, um, create, I've accidentally created a different kind of broken queue. Um, so this is, um, actually hard to demonstrate because of what I just did. I'm going to, um, quickly simulate this problem. So I've targeted this queue. I'm going to save and quit QLab so that it can't notice what I'm doing. Quit QLab. Yep, stop all queues and quit. Now I'm going to delete the test sound queue. Let me just make sure. Yeah, okay, so I've deleted the test sound queue. Now I'm gonna reopen my workspace. And indeed, this test sound is missing its target. So what I can now ask it to do under the tools menu is open the file target search tool and QLab can look in a folder of my choosing. I could go all the way, I can go all the way up or down the folder hierarchy, and it will search everything within that folder. It's found zero possible matches after searching 994 files in 97 folders. And of course it did, because I don't have another queue called testsound.m4a, another file that is the same length as the one I deleted. So this cannot be automatically fixed, but if it did find something that matched with the same name and apparently the same length, I could simply check that box and say, yes, please use this file to replace the missing file, update, and get on with it. Uh, so not the best demo today, I'm afraid, but I assure you this works. Brian Yanni asks, is there a way to control the audio level of all child cues in a parent queue via a parent master? Um, all right, well, no, there's not. Um, group cues don't have audio levels, but that's an interesting idea. Um, I will take this opportunity to say that we have um, chosen to stop using the word master in QLab and instead use the word main wherever possible. Um, uh, Master is a word that is fraught, uh, at least in our country, but perhaps all over the place. And um, since main level and master level mean the same thing, and main is not a fraught word, felt to us like a very easy change to make. Um, 
I'm not criticizing you for using the word whatsoever. You should use the words that you think you should use. Just letting you know the change in language uh, under our roof. So if you look in the levels tab, you will see now that this says main level. What you can do is select multiple audio cues and adjust all, all their levels at once. Or you can adjust one level, copy it, select all the others, command, shift, paste, and paste levels. Eric asks, on the same kind of topic, are there any thoughts on implementing a null object queue, a queue that can be changed and affect multiple other queues, alternatively a child queue that are affected by the mother queue? Eric, I am so sorry to say, I do not understand what you're talking about. Um, but whatever a null object queue is, we don't have it. Uh, Maximilian says, thank you. The name change is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Uh, in the similar vein, um, lighting in the lighting terminology, the word submaster in QLab is now called the subcontroller. Um, just seems like a, again, seems like the same thing. Not, doesn't quite roll off the tongue the same way, but easy enough. Eric says, at the moment, I'm using the play queue this way, but it's not so easy to work with. By the play queue, I assume you mean the start queue. And um, again, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't really know what you mean by a queue that can be a change and affect multiple other queues. Um, the design philosophy of QLab is that queues that have targets have exactly one target. And that is an important piece, we believe, of QLab's design. Um, a start queue can start one other queue. If you need to start multiple queues, you can either make multiple start queues or put all the queues you want to start into a group and then use the start queue to start the whole group. And that is the design of that. Oh, I lost my lovely background. Um, all right, so now we're going to try to go through had this whole thing all programmed up just nicely for for all these different um, demos. Blah 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 blah. Okay, here we go. Queuing, queuing improvements. Zero count slices. Uh, so previously. To skip a section of an audio file when you um, when you played it, you would need to create two separate cues, one for the part before the bit you wanted to skip and one for the part after the bit you'd want to skip. Now all you need to do is slice the cue, put zero into the play count, and QLab will automatically skip over that section of the audio file seamlessly and exactly the same way every single time. Um, zero count slices are sample accurate and are stable. So whatever they do once, they will do all the time. Uh, now there's a bunch of questions uh, that I'm going to follow up on. Um, uh, BJ, sorry if I missed this, but do the workspace settings contain video services, control points, etc.? Yeah, uh, the workspace settings saves. BJ, are you asking about being able to um, export video outputs from a workspace. Uh, in QLab 5, we call them stages. Uh, if that is your question, the answer is yes. You can output stages from a workspace and bring them into another workspace, no problem. Maximilian asks, is there a way to use QLab 5 as a live looper? So mics in and then record and quickly play and layer with recordings and effects? No, that is outside the bounds of QLab. QLab is not a looper. That sounds like maybe you want to try Ableton Live. Um, but I'm not a live user, so maybe maybe I'm not saying correctly. Um, BJ corrected me. The surfaces you edited, like with the Bezier curve, etc. I don't I don't really know exactly what you mean, but all of the workspace settings in a workspace can be exported. So anything you go into workspace settings and do, that can all be exported and imported into another workspace. So I think that no matter what it is exactly that you're talking about, the answer is 
yes, this is possible. Um, but da, ba, da, ba, ba, da. Chris Holder says, I'm assuming the null that is being re referenced would be used like CSS, HTML, where you can set global settings and make one change to cascades of queues. I don't, I'm going to abort this, this, uh, this question read because as soon as we started talking about CSS and HTML and cascading, I'm not really sure what's going on, but the answer is no, QLab does not do that. Um, um, that sound, sounds groovy, but something else. Um, conditional coloration is another uh, new feature. Cues can have their color set in the basics tab, but we now have a menu that lets you choose whether the color appears before the queue is run, after the queue is run, or all the time. You can then um, reset the queue using a reset queue or uh, the reset command in OSC or AppleScript, or you can close and reopen the workspace and queues will reset. Have you already shown how to apply a mask inside of video output preferences, asks Youth Speaks. The answer is no, I have not yet shown how to do that. So we can talk about that if you like. We already talked about time code chasing, so I'll skip over this. Um, the next thing that's new that I like to talk about is network device definitions. So we have built into QLab a set of OSC libraries for commonly used uh, programs and devices. Um, so for example, this network queue is patched to a patch that is set to use the ETC EOS family. So we can say queues, run queue in specific list, list to Q53, and QLab will create the appropriate OSC command. This is uh, an improvement for me personally, because I find looking up the OSC command for a particular task on an EOS or on a um, DS100 or on any of the various things I use to remote control um, with OSC, I find looking up all those commands gets really tiring or really time consuming. So we have built in a set of templates to QLab that lets you just follow the clicks and with menus and text entry fields and sliders so that you can easily create um, OSC commands to remote control your stuff. Um, Youth Speak says, yes, please. Okay, great. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Matt McPhail asks, Mac, I'm sorry. I'm, I, I realize I'm just saying whole names without any regard to how they're actually pronounced. So I will just try to simplify as much as possible and say, Matt asks, is there a method of locating the transients in audio files for the purposes of creating slices at the exact downbeat of measure? In Pro Tools, this is called tab to transient. Yes, I'm familiar with this. Um, in uh, Twisted Wave, it's called locate zero cross crossing. Um, QLab does not have this facility. Um, the waveform view in QLab is an approximation. Um, if you have a multi-track audio file, we show only one waveform, which is a sort of sum of the various tracks in the file. Um, it's something I'm interested in. It's something we may add. Um, but this is a good time to say there is right now a list of about 1,500 things we'd like to do in QLab. Bug fixes that are not critical. I mean, not mission critical, like little bugs that are an annoyance but don't tend to cause showstoppers, um, and feature requests. So of that list of 1,500 things, our dev team of six people can only work on so much at a time. So we have to prioritize that whole list and reprioritize the whole list all the time. And we are constantly evaluating that list and constantly evaluating what we should do next. And something like um, tab to transient or find zero crossing is like one of those things that seems really groovy and also is easy to get by without because you can um, in Pro Tools or Logic or Reaper or whatever, find your transient, add a marker, export as AIFF, and then that marker appears in QLab. It's not ideal. It's not as fast. It would be cool to have it in QLab, but not like utterly critical. So uh, I will say that the more people write in and say that such and such a feature is something we really should add soon, the easier it is for us to justify spending time and energy on that feature. So. If there's a pet feature that you have and you write in and explain to us how you will use it and what you could do with that feature that you can't do now, 
that really helps us decide to prioritize something higher. Uh, Matt says doing fine on the pronunciation. Thank you for that. Tyler, would there be any plans to add user targets on EOS OSC queues? I don't know what that means, Tyler. If you want to um, expand upon it, I will look into it. Um, if, you're, if user targets is an EOS or ETC specific term, I am not um, a total novice in the e ETC speak, but I am not a total expert. So please fill me in on what you mean and I'll look into it. Um, Brian said, a conditional color tool, super nice, as if Keylove was designed by theater folks for theater folks, which is in fact exactly what's going on. Uh, here's a network queue in Meyer Galaxy normal mode. Here's a network queue for uh, Elacoustics Elisa, or Lisa, depending on which side of the Atlantic you're on when you were taught how to pronounce that name by an Elacoustics technician. Here's a DS100 queue that fades uh, and a sound object throughout a fade space. And then here's a hex queue, just real simple. We now support sending hex values, hexadecimal values. Um, for those of you out there who are talking to Barco projectors, mostly this is for you. We also have a new mode for the group queue. It is the playlist mode. Uh, a playlist mode group queue only plays one of its children at a time. I can subvert that by going in there and starting a queue individually. But this playlist mode group queue in the triggers tab, a second trigger plays the next queue. So when the playlist mode group is selected and I hit go, it advances the slide. Go and it advances the slide. A playlist mode group queue that contains things that have durations, so these are two second queues, can be set to, it will automatically advance, it can be set to loop, and it can be set to crossfade automatically. So let's make this a little bit more humane in speed. Now there are five second queues. When I select the playlist mode group queue, I have a playlist tab in the inspector, and here we have options. Auto shuffle, loop until stopped, crossfade, crossfade duration, and then here's a fade editor to adjust the fade shape of the crossfade. Um, playlist mode group cues are easily, uh, make it easy to do walk-in music, slideshows, um, light chases, series of, um, a series of MIDI message that needs, MIDI messages that need to be sent in a loop. So highly recommended. Um, looking into these and seeing how they will work with your needs. Uh, Tyler, you has filled me in a little bit on user targets. So basically EOS OSC commands can be linked to a specific user. So it only happens on a specific command line. This can be useful because user zero is a background user, so it doesn't clear the command line. For example, EOS user zero Q5101 fire fires if I get this right, Q101 in list five as user zero. But if I sent that same OSC message as EOS user one Q5101, then it would be as though user one hit go on their command line. Maybe that's the associate or the programmer or whoever. Um, I didn't know about that. Now I do. I can add that. That doesn't seem like such a big deal. So if you will forgive me, I'm going to very quickly Take a memo, add support for EOS users to EOS network. Got it. Thank you for that, Tyler. Uh, ba -ba -da -ba. Garrett is pleased with pre-show music playlists. Yes, me too. Sean says, will we be able to use AppleScript to change audio trim levels of a queue similar to level playing field in the cookbook but change the audio trim? Uh, right now, there is no plan to add AppleScript access to the trim tab. The point of the trim tab specifically is to have a non-automatable level control that is protected from changes due to automation. Um, the point of the trim tab is you can't affect this except by coming in here with your mouse and getting at it. 
Johanna asks, is there a way in QLab to have a queue, queue number one, that can run anytime during the show, but specify that if this and this and this queue is running, then the queue number one won't work? Johanna, in, at the surface, the answer is no, but what you can do is create a series of arm and disarm queues, which disarm queue number one when certain other things occur or arm it when certain other things don't occur. So for example, I worked on a show, um, a really wonderful show um, and a really scary show that had a gunshot live on stage at the very end of the play. The play um, was called um, Punk Rock. And most of the play, you have no reason to believe that you will you're watching a play where a gunshot might occur, but then the gun comes out and is waved around on stage for a while before it's fired, and it's very frightening. And because the gun that the director wanted to use on stage was not supremely reliable, it would occasionally jam, we made a very careful recording of that gun on that stage, which could be played at a moment's notice if the gun jammed, so that we would not interrupt the flow of the event uh, of the gunshot in the in the text. So we had a recording and we had a cue that played that recording, but it would be completely unacceptable for that cue to play at any time, except in the event of the gun jamming. So here's what I did. I had a cue in my workspace called gunshot backup. And I set a trigger for it. When the sound operator pressed zero on their keyboard, that gunshot cue played. Then I disarmed the cue. Now this cue won't fire no matter what. It's disarmed. But when the sound cue that the scene, uh, the sound cue right before the moment of the gunshot played, it used an arm cue to arm the gunshot back up. So in the scene before, there was some other sound cue. Oh, sorry, I'm very clumsy here. And together grouped with that some other sound cue was an arm cue, which enabled the gunshot backup cue. Then after the moment happened on stage, if the prop gun worked, the sound operator automatically took this cue, disarm gunshot backup, and now the gunshot backup sound cue was safe and could not be fired again. So, Johanna, you could, if this and this and this cue is running, you could say, okay, well, if this cue is running, auto follow it to a disarm cue that disarms my cue number one. And then you could create another cue that rearms that cue number one when this cue ends. You could create an environment like the one you're talking about. I hope that this helps. It's a sort of complicated idea. There you go. Cameron asks, is there any, are there any plans to allow a second output stage with time code queue time remaining for a show caller, director, or similar usage, as well as this audio normalization across all queue requested? Um, Cameron, so it sounds to me like you're asking um, two separate questions. The first one is, is there a plan to create an automatic video output that has time code and queue time remaining for someone to monitor it? Um, and the short answer is no, but the long answer is what you want to do, the result that you're looking for is achievable right now. And I'll talk about that in a sec. The second question is, audio normalization across all cues requested. Someone's asked it before. Um, it is hard to imagine that being universally useful. It's easy to see how an individual situation might come up where you wish all your cues were normalized. Uh, and for those who don't know, normalized means made as loud as possible without clipping. Um, but um, since so much of what for example, I use QLab for involves careful discerning level setting. 
the idea of any kind of automatic level setting sort of blowing away my changes is, would be pretty upsetting to me. It's not that hard to normalize your audio files outside QLab. Um, if you're the sort of person who knows what normalize means, then you are also the sort of person who can do it uh, to your source material. So while I could be persuaded that it's a valuable thing to put in QLab, I also think that uh, it seems likely to me to sort of cause as many troubles as it uh, solves. The other question about uh, an output slash stage with time code, queue time remaining, or et cetera. Um, uh, again, it sounds to me like you have sort of a specific idea in your head about how your show is programmed and how displaying certain information might work. But the truth is that everyone's show works a little differently. And some, uh, if I implemented a feature that worked just the way you're imagining, it might be utterly useless for some other folks. So instead, what we do is, if you want to create a status display, um, there are a bunch of tools in QLab um, that allow you to um, get information about what's playing and display it in the text of a text queue, for example. So you could build your own careful status display. But also, I'm going to show you in a little bit about networking and collaboration tools. And I'm going to show you how I believe the new collaboration tools are going to get you exactly what you want. Um, Cameron followed up on the subject of normalizing. I'm thinking of something similar to MITI, which is a software uh, program that I haven't used, so I, I don't really know what it is, where it can be flat for certain situations such as broadcast. So yeah, I don't, I don't really know what MITI does, so, um, but the answer is uh, no, there's no normalizing built into QLab, and it seems to me not too terribly difficult to uh, either you know, put an audio unit plugin uh, that's a good compressor expander on your Q outputs, and that sort of has the same effect, or to just normalize your audio files themselves. Um, Okie dokie, uh, Tom. I may have missed this, but if you fade a playlist cue, will it keep the entire list faded when the next track starts? Will the group remain faded under? Um, I haven't tried that. I don't know the answer, Tom, but my guess is that it will work according to the same rules bef as before, which is queues which are neither loaded nor running will not be affected by a fade queue. So if you want to run a fade queue on a group and have it affect all the queues in the group, just make sure that all the queues in that group are either running or loaded at the moment of running the fade queue, and you have what you need. Um, Catherine Freer, hello, Catherine, and how are you? I uh, love the new stage editor. That's wonderful. The new stage editor is something that we worked really hard on. It's a, the most complicated part of QLab. And um, if, if even some folks find it easier to use than the old one, to me, that is a big win. Uh, Sean uh, is helping to answer Cameron. That's great. That's great. OK, where are we? George from TFM asks, for things like musicals, is it possible to permanently show the current playing tracks waveform in show mode no no right now there is no way to show the waveform of a cue in show mode in some cases the sound operator needs to see where a track fades up or down etc um you for right now if there's anything that you uh your workflow does that depends upon seeing the waveform view of a cue in the time and loops tab uh which is to say here if you were looking here, here we go. Here's an audio cue that isn't broken. This, if you have any part of your workflow that needs to see this, your show has to happen in edit mode, which is no big deal as long as you are careful to not change something by mistake. Um, but um, we have had some requests and some repeated requests for um, making this waveform view visible in some way while in show mode, and we understand that some folks want that, and we are thinking about it. It's on the list. It's um, lower priority than a lot of other things, but we can continue to explore it. Um, Tyler asks, is it intentional that you can no longer export a stage grid image like in V4? Hmm. We used to have a button here to export this grid. We didn't re-implement that. Um, it was not so much that we intentionally removed it. It was that we built this whole thing up again from scratch and didn't add that bit 
um, because very few people have ever asked us about it. Very few people have talked about its value. If that is valuable to you and you can explain how, I implore you to write to us and say so because we'd love to know more about it. It's not that big a deal to add. We just have to find a place in the interface for the button. Um, but it's not, um, it just wasn't something people used a lot as far as we could tell. So we didn't put um, a lot of priority on re-implementing it. And as I've said, that part of QLab's interface is, is challenging. So we're trying to keep it as streamlined as we can. George says it would be nice, might have happened in one of my shows before. Um, I'm not, not sure what, what has happened in one of your shows before, but I understand the request about the waveform and there we go. Uh, okay. We talked about playlist mode. Going to talk briefly about audition mode, which is what you're looking at right now. Um, audition mode. So when your workspace is, uh, let's back in V4, you turned audition mode on or off by opening or closing the audition window. And this was fine. When the audition window was open, video cues played into the audition window. The audition window had an audio patch. You could choose that all audio would play through that patch instead of the cues assigned patch. That was great. But what this didn't do is it didn't let you audition different video outputs distinctly. It just had them all side by side in this window. And it didn't let you sort of flexibly decide, listen, when I audition, I want video to do this, audio to do this, but I don't want to change what MIDI is doing. Or I don't want to change what lighting is doing or whatever like that. So in QLab 5, we've replaced audition mode with a different sort of paradigm where instead of being in a mode or not, auditioning is an action that you take upon a cue. And how QLab behaves when you audition a cue depends upon the audition settings for the workspace. So go is the spacebar by default. Audition go is option spacebar by default. Preview is V, option V is audition preview. And I'm gonna open workspace settings and go to audition and show you here seven menus which define the audition behavior for the seven signal types that come out of QLab. Right now in this workspace, when I audition anything that produces audio, that audio is left unchanged. I could switch that to no output or I could switch it to a specific patch. Video redirects to the audition window, and there's a different audition window for each stage. So I could, if I have three stages coming out of QLab, arrange my audition windows to reflect the actual physical arrangement of the three stages on, uh, in, in the theater. And that way, I could, um, I could emulate the layout of my actual outputs on my uh, audition monitor layout. Video can be redirected to the audition window or suppressed or left alone, or all video could be routed to an individual special stage. So for instance, you could create an NDI output from QLab, and whenever you audition a video, it plays to that NDI output. And then you could put monitors in front of the director um, and the producer and whoever else and have them all say, all right, do you want to check this out before I play it? Great, audition go. The cue plays, everyone's monitor, they all like it. Then you go real go and it plays to output. We also have uh, individual audition settings for MIDI output, for MIDI timecode, linear timecode, network output, and lighting. Lighting, the choices are leave unchanged or redirect to the audition tab of the dashboard, which is functions like uh, what you ETC folks might know as blind mode. Um, we just call it the audition tab where you see the levels happening, but they don't actually go out to your actual lighting system. Network, the choices are leave output unchanged or suppress it. LTC and MTC both let you choose an alternate patch, leave it alone or suppress it. MIDI lets you select an alternate patch, leave it alone or suppress it. Then separately from all this, under the tools menu, you can turn on and off always audition. And when you, when you are in always audition mode, every go is an audition go. Every preview is an audition preview. When you are not in always audition mode, hitting go on a cue will play it for real, but hitting option go on the cue will audition play it. 
And that's audition mode. Finally, networking and collaboration uh, changes. First, I'd like to talk briefly about the um, the bits that have uh, changed from QLab 4, and then I'll talk about the bits that are completely new. So in network settings, um, we talked about the various output patches uh, and their various types, but we didn't look at it. So here's what it looks like. When you create a patch, you can choose which software or hardware device you want to control, and QLab will use the library that we've built for each of those devices. Um, we're about to add um, a, a network library for uh, Luminaire, and we're, um, someone asked us to add a network library for um, the uh, Motu AVB audio interfaces, so we're working on that one. We'll continue to add these as people request. Um, please let us know what devices you want to remote control with OSC, and we will add them here. Um, in, so that's network outputs. We have a question here. In network queues with fades, I can't specify, let's just say 0.04 to 0, just from 1 to 0. Is that a bug uh, or the way it's supposed to work? I don't believe that that's right. If I have a network queue and I choose a 1D fade, my message value, you're saying from 0 to 1, you want to go from uh, 0.4 to 0, so 0 0.4 to 0. No problem. You just have to make sure that this menu is set to floats, not integers. Floats means floating point numbers, numbers that include decimals. So that's your move there, Eric. Um, David asks, are all of those predefined network things OSC? That is a wonderful question, and I thank you for asking it. Um, strictly speaking, uh, let's see here. Strictly speaking, the Christie RS-232C mode is um, uh, sending plain ASCII text, which is interpreted as though it's RS-232. So it's not all OSC, George. Uh, George? David. David. Um, it is uh, any OSC message, plain network text, um, hexadecimal network messages, uh, you know, hexadecimal text over the network. Um, but we have a facility sort of under the covers to do some more elaborate stuff. So if you have an, a specific interest, it's something that we can explore. We've sort of laid ourselves the groundwork to do something a little bigger and a little broader. Um, George asks, where'd we send in requests for controlling consoles? Um, and to be clear, George, not just any console, it must be a console that can communicate with either OSC or plain text or hex, hexadecimal text, either over TCP or UDP. It has to be a network control protocol that is published. Um, and you send those requests to support at figure53.com. Um, um, I hope that that answers David's question and I hope that it answers George's question. Um, as of right now, we are making these ourselves, um, but we do plan eventually to open up the possibility of you making your own custom network device definitions. It's just a bit of a slog, and so we're gonna wait to make sure that we really like how everything works, that everything is completely sort of consistent, and then we will open that up uh, to everyone. Okay, meanwhile, as we were saying, um, network changes in QLab 5. So we've already talked about this part. The OSC access tab um, is a little different than it was in QLab 4. QLab 4 allowed OSC, pardon me, allowed OSC connections, yes or no, and allowed you to use a passcode or no passcode. But what we have now is, and it can have different types of permission for computers or uh, devices that connect using that particular passcode. So right now, any uh, external OSC communicating device that communicated with this workspace without using a passcode can view the workspace and can control the workspace, but cannot edit the workspace. If you connect with passcode 9789, you can view and control and edit the workspace. The way that we define this is uh, view is basically permission to connect at all. If you have only view permission, 
you can view a workspace, you can flag or unflag queues, and you can change the notes of a queue, but nothing else. If you add edit permission, you can add and delete queues, and you can change settings for uh, workspaces or for queues. You can adjust anything, but you can't start or stop queues. The control permission allows you to start queues, stop queues, and change the location of the playhead. Edit and control together is full access. So I can add as many passcodes as I like and give each of them unique sets of permission. You get the picture. OK. Let's just set this back to how it was so that the next time I demo this workspace, it will be ready. Over here, you can change the port that each workspace listens on. QLab as a whole always listens on port 53,000, but you can set an individual workspace. OK, I want uh, this workspace to listen on 53,012. You can set this number to any number you like, but it is our recommendation to use five-digit numbers only um, because those are the so-called ephemeral ports, which are um, understood by everyone to be um, sort of uh, the Wild West. Ports uh, with four digits or fewer, many of those are officially designated for certain tasks, but five-digit ports are just a free-for-all. The uppermost uh, port number is 65535. There are no ports above that number. This is the plain text listening port, which allows QLab to listen for plain text received via UDP, which will then attempt to interpret as OSC. And now I'm going to check in in the chat on questions that have been asked while I've been jabbering. Um, let's see, David's really excited to ATEM OSC. Yes, that's great. Um, Eric, a general question. How do you track down wireless NDI issues? No, that's not a question for me. That's a question for the chat. Matt Reynolds Designs says, how about talking to architectural lighting or access systems like Paradigm, Unison, Lutron, Quantum, or Blackboard? I don't know anything about any of those systems, um, although they all sound proprietary and they all sound like the kind of thing where we would have to buy a license to communicate with them. Um, if you know anything about any of those, um, uh, those paradigms, um, if you know anything about any of them and think that QLab should communicate with one of them, if you can give us an example of a situation where QLab being able to communicate with one of those systems would really save the day, we would love to hear about it and we're happy to look into it. Right now, QLab directly interfaces with a very small number of external um, devices that require special code in QLab, notably Blackmagic video devices. And the reason that we built in Blackmagic video device support is because Black Magic is, um, in our in our gathering, the most prolific manufacturer of reliable but relatively inexpensive video input and output hardware. There's a lot of other video input and output and hardware that is very high end and very expensive. Um, there's a lot of video input and output hardware that's pretty esoteric. But Black Magic is the sort of the sweet spot of pretty affordable, pretty well made, and uh, pretty wide general purpose use. Uh, in their in their approach. Um, so we built in Blackmagic support. Maybe Paradigm, Unison, Lutron, Quantum, or Blackboard, maybe one of those is like that for architectural lighting. And if it is, we should explore it. Um, but as of right now, we speak DMX for lighting, and um, we speak MIDI, OSC, MSC. We can send SysX. So we feel like we have sort of a, a pretty broad range covered. But let us know. Let us know. OK. That is OSC access. But now I want to talk about collaboration, which is a new feature set for QLab. So I'm running another computer on my local network. Um, I live in a house that's a converted church, and we have some LED uh, color changing fixtures in the belfry of the church. And so I have a little Mac Mini controlling that um, controlling that, uh, that, those lights in that belfry. On that Mac Mini, a QLab workspace is open, running in QLab 5. I'm sitting here on my laptop, and I'm going to go to the QLab menu and choose Connect, nope, the File menu, and choose Connect to Workspace. And when I 
open this workspace, uh, open this window, I am shown via Bonjour, which is a networking standard, I am shown available workspaces running on my network. Here's the name of the workspace, here's the name of the computer that's running on it, and here's the name of the IP address of that computer. When I choose connect, QLab attempts to connect to that other computer. And uh, though you can't see it where you are, I am now um, viewing the monitor of that computer and I'm clicking accept with full access. So I have now logged in to this other computer remotely. This workspace is the workspace running on that other Mac. I'm remotely connected to it, and I can tell I'm remotely connected to it because it says remote and because my toolbar, my title bar is purple and the go button highlight ring is purple. And because down here, it shows me the, connect, the collaboration icon and the edit permissions that I have, view, edit, and control. This yellow dot shows the highlight permission, the highlight position of the other user. So I've selected this queue, Bell Tower Orange, but on the other Mac, Q 5 p.m. is selected, and I can tell because that's where the yellow dot is. This allows two or more people to collaborate on a workspace. And um, we just did a QLab class last week which demonstrated this um, process, and I had about 25 people simultaneously connected over a high-end Wi-Fi network and all collaboratively editing one QLab workspace. So this is a way to get multiple folks working together, uh, hopefully without messing with each other. It's a big improvement, in my opinion, over using screen sharing or KVM. KVM only comes in two forms, extraordinarily expensive and pretty reliable, or affordable and barely reliable. And so I'm done with KVM wherever possible. I'm gonna try to use QLab collaboration instead. Um, this, uh, George from TFM just asked a question about licensing, which makes me really happy that you asked that question at that time, because this is exactly the topic I wanna to go into next, which is the licensing of QLab 5, which is just a little bit different. Um, when you buy a QLab 5 license, you get two activations. That's down from three in QLab 4, but in exchange for reducing the number of activations, what we have added is those two activations can be used however you want. If you have two theaters, you can use both those activations to run a show in each theater. If you want to run two Macs, both doing playback of audio on one show for whatever reason, you can use those two activations that way. If you want a main and a backup, which I do remember someone asked about earlier in the chat, I will get to that shortly, uh, you can do that. Uh, the point is, rather than enforcing a specific policy, we give you two seats to use, two activations to use however you like, in addition. A licensed copy of QLab can host collaboration clients, and one of those clients can have no license installed at all and still connect with full powers. It can also host an unlimited number of collab collaboration clients with no license. And this answers the question that the person asked earlier about having a remote view for a stage manager or director or whatever who wants to see the active queues display. If you open the active queues display here, it will show queues that are running in the workspace. So this allows someone who has a free unlicensed copy of QLab on a Mac, if you give them view only access, they can see every queue, they can see what's running, they can see all the time code or whatever they like. They can even see waveforms of audio queues. So to do what this person was asking about earlier in terms of providing a monitor for a collaborator, this is the way. Any number of free copies can connect. Any number of licensed copies can connect. And one free copy can connect with full access permission. You can also give individual collaborators different access permission. And you can click here to forget the collaborator. You can optionally restrict all your collaborators to view only mode when, you're, when, the, when the workspace is in show mode. And of course, you can disable collaboration altogether. I'm now going to go back to the chat and look and see what folks folks are talking about. Lutron and Paradigm and 
architectural lighting, which doesn't really seem like questions to me. Um, Matt says, my thought is to propose QLab as the main integration controller for each of these disparate facility control systems. When I managed a theater center, I had to operate them each individually. It would be nice to be able to trigger or control all of these from one interface, such as a lockdown sequence that turns on ghost lights, turns off non-safety building lights, locks all doors, and so forth. Yeah, uh, I, I guess I understand the broad concept, but I would love to know more about the specific protocols uh, that you have in mind and um, and like... What's the, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, what's the production goal? Not just the sort of like, well, it's convenient for me to be able to not go to a bunch of different control panels. Like, I don't, I don't want to minimize that. That's important. But I'm talking about like, what's the piece of theater that you can create if we add this integration? Or what, what's, the, what's the audience facing result? I guess that's what I'm really interested in. Um, all right. That concludes the list of things that I wanted to make sure that I talk about. Um, uh, it's 3.26 my time. Um, I am available to stay as long as until 5 p.m. my time. And as long as folks still keep asking questions, I will keep answering them. Or you don't even have to ask questions. You could just say, here's a topic. Please." Please talk about this topic. That's fine with me too. Um, Matt says it's purely for administrative use, not for production. So yeah, so that seems cool. And also that is, um, it's hard to decide to prioritize things that don't um, directly improve the life of the audience member that's going to see a show that QLab is plugged into. I'm not saying I can't do it. I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. I'm not saying you're wrong at all. But I think that Purely um, administrative tools sort of take a back seat to audience facing tools. Uh, and I agree with what Chris said, um, architectural lighting, anything that you can put a interface on that speaks OSC, MSC, MIDI voice message, MIDI sysx, uh, time code, response to Apple script events, or um, uh, can respond to um, uh, plain text or hexadecimal text over TCP or UDP, Kilo can already control. And so I encourage you, or uh, DMX, that's the last one. I encourage you to focus on those possibilities for right now and write to us and talk more with us about what you've got in mind and how it could benefit many folks. And then let's dig in. Steve asks, who do we contact if we wanna have you present this in Maryland to the MTEA USITT? I assume that's a USITT chapter or uh, affiliation. And that sounds great, it's a regional conference. Um, you contact, um, you contact us, you contact, um, uh, you can write to me directly, sam at figure53.com. I guess I can put that up here. Oh, that's full, full stage. Now we want custom geometry there. There we go. So if you write to me, you get um, you get direct access to this individual at whatever speed works for my my workday. If you have an immediate need for help with QLab, either uh, exploratory help, like you want to learn how to do something, or hands-on help, like I'm doing X and it is failing, write to support. Um, Matt. Uh, bah, bah, bah. No, sorry, kind of back it up. So Marcelo says, nice things. Thank you so much for saying nice things. Um, Cameron, would you look at an option to turn off all grids and guides on all stages uh, through the view menu or similar? Any plans for a moving grid? I don't know what a moving grid is, and I'd love to hear more about it, Cameron. Um, right now, yes, I think um, we have an OSC message to turn on and off all grids and guides. So you can do it using an OSC message right now, but it does seem like it would be very convenient to have um, a one-stop shop for that in the UI somewhere. Um, Matt is bumping the earlier question. Um, see above reconsole view for OSC. Which, Matt, can you give me a, uh, Matt McPhail, can you give me a brief refresher on which earlier question you're bumping? Um, Steve is sending stuff, thank you for that. 
Uh, Brian mentions QSIS, and QSIS is amazing and also outside my purview. I don't want nothing to do with it. Not because I dislike it. It's just I got enough going on. Ken4631 says, now that zero creates a zero count slice, what's the key for creating an infinite loop? The answer is anything that isn't a, uh, a number. So to um, if you put zero, you'll get a zero count. If you put five, you'll get a five count. If you put a large number, you'll get a large number account. But if you type any letter or any punctuation, you get an infinite loop. Um, ba -ba -ba -da -ba -da. The question above is about OSC. Is there a console view that lets us see actual text of OSC coming into QLab? The answer is yes. Go to the workspace status window. Go to the logs tab and tick OSC input and you will see any OSC coming into QLab. That's the move. Um, Cameron says, you'll email me about moving grid. That sounds great. I'm excited to hear about it. Um, Cameron says, also niche, is there a way to remove all old licenses from QLab after they have expired? We often send out machines that have old email addresses and account emails. Uh, that's something you should write to support about. We'll talk about that. It sounds like you're maybe a rental shop or a person who loans out or sends out computers for other people to use, and that is a bit more detailed. Um, some nice folks just saying nice things, and I appreciate all of you for saying those nice things. Uh, ba -da -da, ba -da -da, ba -da -da, ba -da. Okay, so we remain in the general questions asking phase uh, or, or topic raising section, I say, not just question asking. Jay Adrian, um, how do the system requirements for V5 compare to those for V4? What a great question. Thank you for this. I love answering this question because it's really actually very straightforward. I beg your pardon. QLab 5 requires Mac OS 11 or newer. If your Mac runs Mac OS 11 or newer, it will run QLab 5 just fine. Practically speaking, eight gigabytes of RAM is a good minimum, and that is uh, the same recommendation for QLab 4 or 5. I will also say Apple Silicon Macs are insanely fast. They are incredibly impressive. Even the cheapest Apple Silicon Mac outperforms most Intel Macs ever built in any kind of show control situation. So in general, if you're looking at a new Mac, and look at Apple Silicon Macs only. Um, if you're looking at a, a literally new Mac, I mean, that's all that Apple makes now, except for the Mac Pro. But honestly, if a person is considering buying a Mac Pro right now, I encourage you to consider instead buying a Mac Studio and just spend whatever money you were gonna spend on the Pro on a Mac Studio instead and get a dramatically better computer for your money. Um, there are also these, um, there are also these considerations when you're talking about uh, running a QLab Mac for video. The, uh, any Intel Mac that has only integrated graphics will perform modestly with video. Put them aside. Intel Macs with um, discrete GPUs, and by discrete, I don't mean polite and subtle. I mean separate. Intel Macs with discrete GPUs perform much better for video. All Apple Silicon Macs perform better for video than any Intel Mac with any GPU. I just did an installation with something like a $20,000 Mac Pro with two Vega GPUs in it, driving eight projectors. There were several of these Mac Pros driving eight projectors each, and they were not bad. A Mac Studio with an M1 Ultra or even an M1 Max CPU in it would outperform those Mac Pros for sure. So that's video performance. The next thing you need to know about video is that any Mac with an M1 or M2 processor that isn't the M1 Pro, Max, or Ultra, just the M1 normal, is limited to a single hardware video output. If you're running video and you only need to drive one projector, one screen, whatever, 
an M1 or an M2 Mac, even the MacBook Air will probably do fine unless you have really complicated needs. If you need more outputs, the M1 Pro, M1 Max, and M1 Ultra support a greater number of displays. So that is system recommendations. If you are planning for an unknown show, a show that you don't know how hard it will be, you're not sure, like you just want a good burly Mac ready for anything, allow me to direct you to the 16 inch MacBook Pro with the M1 Max processor. That Mac is gonna just kick ass. And if you don't know where to go and you just wanna be ready for something, that's the way to go. The Mac Studio, similar, stellar, impressive. If, if you buy a Mac Studio, pretty much any configuration, you're sitting pretty. Okay. Um, now some folks have, have there been any changes to, oh, now the chat's really going because I've, I've encouraged you to use it. So now it's really going. So I got to scroll. All right. Um, someone talked about QSIS. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Um, Tyler realized I'm the ones writing the manual. Love all the jokes. Thank you so much. I do it mostly for myself, but I'm glad that you enjoy them. Um, also because like, and here's like a pedagogical philosophy here. Like the human brain did not evolve to be good at reading a hundred page or 400 page reference manual for a piece of software. That's not what this hardware was, was destined to do. Over the lifespan of the creatures that eventually grew into human beings, mostly what this evolved to do was find food, avoid dying. And um, reading a manual does not link into the low level parts of the brain that ensure that you're finding food and not dying. So you got to work extra hard to keep it interesting is how I feel. And so peppering in jokes here and there in the manual is a way to like remind your brain that it's awake, even though it's doing something that is like technically totally unimportant for survival. So that's the philosophy behind the jokes in the manual. Uh, George says, I still find it crazy. Apple's still selling the Mac Pro. I think there's a lot of folks who use custom made software developed specifically for the Intel family of processors that need a lot of horsepower. And that's why the Mac Pro is still being sold. My gut instinct is that even when they come out with the Apple Silicon Mac Pro, the Intel Mac Pro will remain available for those um, few customers. Um, but I don't know that for sure. Um, and when they come up with the Apple Silicon Mac Pro, I expect it to be outrageous. Um, people talking to each other about QSIS, which is great. Um, Asa or Asa or something like this. Sorry, I got here a bit late. No problem. Um, I'd love to be able to trigger macros on my TriCaster with QLab. Can QLab send those HTTP commands? Aza, if you would please write to us about that at support at figure53.com. If there's any information you can give us about what messages need to be sent to a TriCaster to trigger it, I want QLab to be able to do that. I'm, I'm invested in that. So let me know about it. Tell us about it. I'm going to try to make it happen. Um, Steve Barker says, so the Mac Studio M1 is fine. Yes, absolutely. Tom says, is there an option to still have an edit backup main format on a license? The answer is no. There are two activations on a license. If you need 10 or more activations, you can buy a site license, which lets you pay per activation for 10 or more um, at a, a per activation price. Um, but that's it. Johanna asks, if I have an iPad backstage showing the workspace of my Mac, is there a way to show the Q display window on the iPad? I don't know what the Q display window is. Um, so tell me more about that, Johanna, and I will try to answer. Um, Andy, in QLab 4, the service editor, there's ability to add a mask. Oh, yeah, someone asked about this before and asked me to get into it, and I haven't yet. Okay. What are the plans for future versions to put a real-time mask editor in QLab? It's difficult to make masks in QLab 4. The answer is yes. It is difficult to make masks live. And yes, we would like to add a mask editor. And no, we haven't yet. We would like to, but we haven't yet. OK, masks. Let's talk about masks for a minute. What is a mask? In video, in video outputs, you see a list of stages. The stage is a virtual space that cues play to. Then the stage is projected, essentially, to output devices. In this case, I'm projecting just to the audition output window, but I could go to 
the built-in retina display is what this is default uh, by default programmed to do. When I edit the stage, here in the stage editor, up at the top is a mask well. When I click load mask, it'll let me pick an image which will be used as a mask. And here's the shtick. The mask image has to be a grayscale image. Where the mask image is white, the stage is drawn. Where the mask image is black, the stage is not drawn. It's transparent. Something behind the stage will show through. So let me see if I can find a mask somewhere on um, whose kind is image. Yeah, okay, so here is an example of a mask image. Um, this is everywhere that is black, I will not see my cues. Everywhere that is white, I will see my cues. So if we take this image and drop it in here, We should now be able to see, hmm, we are not able to see. It's possible that in the audition output, we don't see the mask. But when we drop this in, I uh, take, take it on faith that the area of my screen that the white maps to will be, sh my cues will show through. And the area that is black, the mask will be snipped out. And that in short is how you add a mask. It is a little, um, awkward to be working live with this. So QLab does this thing where it watches this file live. If you open this file up in an image editor and then resave it, QLab will refresh with the new saved copy. You don't have to come drag it in again. So you can load up your image editor on your QLab system, output your video to your real in your real theater, and look and say, oh no, look, that doorway is getting cut off. Let me airbrush it in. Uh, nope, that's not enough, a little bit more. Okay, no, I went too much. Now I'll erase off the edges and so forth. It's not perfect. We would like to add a mask editor. We really would, but it's hard. And it's one of those things where we feel like doing it well or not at all are the two choices on the table. Doing it poorly would not help anybody. So we are not gonna do that. Um, um, I'm checking the comments, and then I'm going to go to the main and backup question, which was asked at the very beginning of the chat. Um, uh, could you touch on how true main and backup systems you achieved? Oh, look, that that's convenient. Okay. Um, Cameron asks, could you touch on how true main and backup systems could be achieved that you mentioned earlier? Is it through QLab, network queues, and a main to child still, or is a better way possible? Philosophy time. Running a redundant backup system is like this. You have your main Mac and your backup Mac. Your main Mac, let's say you're doing audio. Your main Mac outputs to maybe an audio interface, an RME Fireface, or a Scarlet, or a Motu. Um, and then from there, analog audio comes out of that device and goes into your sound system. Or perhaps you have your main Mac with Dante Virtual Sound Card running over a network to a console and then out to your sound system. Then over here, you have your backup Mac what you want is for your backup Mac to be as identical to your main as possible so that everything that happens on your main happens exactly the same way on your backup. Same audio interface, same pathway to the sound system. And the idea is only your main or your backup is actually being heard by the audience at any one moment. And then if something goes wrong with your main, you can switch your sound system to hear the backup or route the backup to your audience's ears. If you're doing video, the same thing. You have video outputs from main, video outputs from backup. They go through perhaps some kind of switch like a Lightware matrix. Lightware is a company that makes uh, really nice DVI and HDMI matrix video switchers. And you have your main, Mac up, your main Mac live to your projectors and your backup output is sort of suppressed. And then when you press the button, it switches and now your backup is live and your main is not. That's the basic principle of a main and a backup system. Thing number one, uh, you want as much as possible to avoid sending messages between your main and backup. Not, no, not, you don't have to make it completely isolated, but the idea is you don't want your main controlling your backup because if your main controlled your backup 
and something went wrong on the main, it could cause something to go wrong on the backup. So the goal is send the same control signals from an external source to both main and backup. As an example, here is a MIDI Go box. And full disclaimer, I make these. This is my product. It is separate from figure 53. This has two USB outputs on the back. And when you press this button, MIDI note one, velocity 127 is sent out of both these outlets at the same time. You plug one into your main, you plug one into your backup, and only that button box is used during performance. So when I press go on that box, both main and backup receive a MIDI go, go, go. But over on my console, the inputs from this Mac are muted and this one are live. If something goes wrong, I can reach over to my console, press a macro or a mute group. Now the main is muted and the backup is unmuted, but external to main and backup is the control box. That's the secret to success with a redundant backup. If there are follow-up questions, we can ask follow-up questions, but that's the short version. Um, Rich Sims, is stage the same as Surface? Yes, Rich. Uh, we call them stages in QLab 5 for two reasons. One is because we changed how they work and what they do. So we wanted to give them a new name to help people mentally with the idea that it's an analogous idea, but it's not identical. Thing two, we found ourselves getting tongue-tied a lot with the word Surface. Uh, I create my Surface in QLab. It goes out of my projector and goes to the surface of my scenery. And that became sort of a linguistic barrier. So stage obviously has its own, you know, I, my video stage is going to get projected out to st on stage. I know it's not perfect either, but we, we're at least trying a different word for that reason too. Cameron says, thanks. And often use cases running into an E2 as two individual inputs and two completely separate outs, two projectors overlaid. Um, sure. Yes. Tyler, is there a way in the future QLab could deal with vector image formats, SVG, PDF, for pixel-perfect scalability directly in QLab as opposed to outputting rastered images in a different resolution? It sounds like a good idea. Uh, I could see us supporting SVGs someday, um, but I don't know if you've ever read about the PDF file format, but it is uh, an evil demon creature coming to get you. Um, the PDF file format is a, a vicious labyrinth that, um, that tantalizes and ensnares the, the kind-hearted. So uh, I think supporting PDFs directly within QLab is asking for pain, um, but supporting SVGs seems not entirely out of the question. Um, as of right now, the move is if you are finding that QLab's rendering is too jaggy for you, just render a larger version of your PNG and scale down only instead of up. Um, Ba -da -ba -da. Johanna, I would love QLab to have a time function. So if a queue is supposed to go live at 8 and I hit at 8.10, a window will show that we are 10 minutes late. That's kind of what queue display does. I don't really... I mean, all right, great. I don't I haven't really thought about that. A window would show that we're 10 minutes late. I'm, would, it, would it behave the same way, just let you know that you're behind schedule, is the question, I guess? Um... Marcelo, what's that MIDI box? Uh, it is, that's called a GoBox Mini, and I make it uh, with my colleague, Mike Dio. Our company is called Team Sound, and you can find us online at teamsound.nyc. Um, Cameron, I use Companion or similar, just wondering if there was a better non-hardware dependent solution for redundance. No, hardware is the best way to run a redundant Mac system. Okay, Eric, in QLab 4, I've experienced some UI slowdowns and even QLab performance slowdowns on the way I program my shows, where I tidy up the programming with a lot of folders and subfolders, where light queues, sound queues, network queues, and so on get grouped in folders, and I remember getting the feedback to unnest the different queues. Has that gotten an overhaul, or is that still what you recommend? We still think that uh, the number of queues playing at once matters, um, and the amount of work that the Mac has to do to draw the interface of QLab matters. Um, the better your computer, the stronger your computer, the less it matters, but it always matters. So if you, I think that you're gonna find, Eric, the exact same limitation, though perhaps the threshold between working well and working poorly will be raised um, or perhaps lowered, but I think it'll be about the same. Um, um, are there plans for audio loop crossfades? 
Um, there are soft plans. It's on the list, but it is not high up on the list. Um, but it is appealing to us. Um, being able to crossfade loops is appealing to us. For sure. All righty. What other questions or comments do you all have? Eric hopes that the M1 Mac does the trick in terms of improving his performance problems. Um, I cannot overstate how much better they perform. I just cannot overstate it. It's so impressive. Johanna, my whole show is running on time because we also serve food. So if the show is late, the kitchen and the bar need to know. So a small window for times would be awesome. Now I understand, Johanna. I think that that's an interesting design problem to solve. And I think that it is pretty specific. And it is difficult for me to imagine a way for that to be broadly applicable to all folks who use QLab. That said, I could imagine programming your show carefully in a way um, that um, queues that were run could run also a script queue that checks the system time, compares it against a stored amount, and says whether we are ahead or behind or whatever. Um, but that sounds pretty, pretty specific to that workflow. And I don't really know how to develop that feature in a way that would be really sort of useful for all sorts of folks doing all sorts of shows. Cameron has, of course, extrapolated from what I've said about broadly applicable and asked what are the most asked for uh, features that are coming next. Um, the most asked for features, uh, as far as I know, are the ones that we put in QLab 5. Um, no, the answer is we get a lot of things a lot of the time. There are sometimes like trends in feature requests. Um, but the truth is that um, we don't discuss what we're going to release. We only discuss what we are releasing. Um, and the reason is we don't want to become trapped by a discussion about a theoretical feature, only to then put in the work to develop the feature and discover that it requires more time than we have allotted, or um, maybe there's a problem with it. So we'd just rather work on what we can work on and respond as much as possible to feedback from you folks who are using QLab and try to let that guide us in terms of where to go next. Um, and yeah, Chris says, I think it would be a great scripting challenge. Um, it would be fun to think about how to send information to the kitchen. Yeah, it's. I agree with Chris. I think it's an Apple script challenge. Jeremy asks, can you go over the details of the site licensing option? Yes. Okay. For um, commercial users of QLab, for folks who are using QLab for anything other than education, you can either buy licenses in which you get two activations per feature set. So if you buy an audio license, you get two activations. But if you buy an audio and video license, you get a total of four activations, two audio and two video, which could go on four max total or could go on two and two or however you like. And if you get a bundle license, audio, audio, video, video, lighting, lighting. Three max, um, three max with both feet, uh, sorry. Three feature sets that could go on two max each or they could get spread out um, across a total of um, six max. Uh, or the next option is to rent those same licenses by the day. Um, it's uh, from five to twelve dollars is the range, depending on what you rent, and you pay upfront for a spec specific date range, and then when the start date comes along, your license wakes up, runs until the number of days that you fought um, happens, and then at the end self deactivates. That's the second option. The third option is a site license. A site license is for those of you who are using ten or more activations of QLab within one context be it a rental house or a large performing arts facility or a school or a, a amusement park or a haunted house or a series of escape rooms run by the same company. A site license lets you buy 10 or more activations of each particular license type. And it's by license type. So you say, I want 10 audio licenses and two video licenses. 
each of those licenses is, oh, I'm sorry, activations, 10 audio activations, two video activations. Once you've bought 10, you can add one by one to your existing site license individually, as many or as few as you like at a time. The site license can then be deployed to as many computers within one organization or one sort of um, logical unit uh, as possible. Um, and then they behave like regular licenses. So that's the site license. If you are going to be using 10 or more Macs, I encourage you to consider that. Um, Matt Early, do the new collaboration tools allow for two designers to be making changes simultaneously to the same workspace without interfering with each other, such as a sound and a video designer? The answer, Matt, is yes. The deal is this. Two folks, or more than two folks, can all work on one workspace. If you work on the exact same queue at the same time, you'll get interference, and whoever made the last edit will win. Um, but you and I could collaborate on a show. Maybe I'm the sound designer, you're the video designer, and I could be like, I'm going to work on scene six. And you could say, fine, I'm going to work on scene eight. And then we're not bothering each other. We could both work on scene six at the same time together as long as we agreed, you and I, with some some rules like, okay, I'm going to make these cues and work on these cues, but I'm going to stay away from those. You work on those and you stay away from mine or something like that. Um, but yes, live in uh, live collaboration all up in there together without very many restrictions is the way it works. Everyone gets their own undo stack. Adding, deleting, and moving cues is not undoable while you're collaborating in order to make sure that the workspace doesn't get into an uncertain state. Um, we share an undo stack for the light dashboard, and also we have separate undo, uh, we share undos for workspace settings, but that's it. Um, Jeremy, what are the educational options? I work at a college. Um, you can find more educational licensing options on our website. I encourage you to poke around, You can, and I encourage you to write to support and ask. There are uh, two types of licenses only available to educational customers, and um, it's, uh, it's much better written out than spoken out loud. Marcelo uh, or Marcello, depending upon what part of the world the name is from, maybe do the rent to own rentals from QLab 4 carry on to QLab 5. So uh, yes, in, in, in a form, um, we've changed the upgrading um, discount system and we've changed rent to own into a store credit system. And here, here's how it works. Licenses that you buy have a dollar value associated with them. When you buy a QLab 5 license, you can turn that license back in and exchange it for store credit equal to the value of that license. So if I bought a $149 license, I exchange it for $149 of credit. If you buy a if you buy rental licenses, you get store credit equal to the value of the licenses you bought. You can use store credit to buy anything in the license store except rental licenses. So if you had rent to own days getting accrued in V4, those have been converted in our store system to a number of dollars. And that amount of money is available to you as credit to offset your um, any future purchases. Um, this system that uses credit is more flexible than rent to own days, doesn't require you to do any math, and also it no longer gives you the 10% penalty in value that the rent to own used to. It's just what you spend is credit, end of story. Um, which Andy asks, which Mac and or external device do you suggest to handle four projectors and one control model monitor driven by Apple Silicon Mac? Um, not knowing much about your setup, I would ask, uh, if if I were the designer and that were the design brief, I would ask for an um, an M1 Max or M1 Ultra uh, Mac Studio, and um, I'd need to know more beyond that for external devices. But I'd start there. Um, Cameron says, "What is the QLab four to five pricing for site license holders? Is it per license or a bundled price upgrade? It is. Um, you have to upgrade a whole site license uh, together. You should write to support to get into details." Andrew Moyer, with collaboration on the remote computer, can you add queues with files on the local computer and do those files get copied to the main? The answer to that is no. You have to copy files to the main computer and then you can add them. So 
what I will do um, when I work on shows with collaboration is open both a collaboration connection and a file sharing connection so that I can copy files into the show folder on the main Mac. And then once they're there and I go to create a queue, I will see files within the workspace uh, project folder available to be added as targets. Tom, with, with site lessons, can you mix and match six audio, four video for a total of 10? Um, I believe the answer is yes. Um, you might need to speak to support about that as um, uh, it doesn't happen automatically in the store. Eric, is there a way to differentiate slices with let's say different colors? Nope, there is not. Uh, this would make it easier to follow a lot of slices crammed together. Uh, I encourage you to investigate whether or not following a lot of slices crammed together is necessarily the best way to solve the problem that I think that you're having. Um, but in short, slices are not color codable. So I'll just leave that there. All righty. What else, what else, friends? This is enjoyable. You're asking great questions. I'm really delighted by them. Um, MDWICHOFF, MDYCHOFF, maybe, says 2021 MacBook Pro 14 inch M1 Pro set default audio output to MacBook Pro speakers. Plugging in headphones now displays all audio output to speakers as broken. Inverse is also true. My workaround is two copies of the show. Okay. First, I'm going to explain why the problem occurs, and then I'm going to explain why you don't need two copies of the show. On Apple has done something slightly differently with this exact issue over the history of laptops, and it's frustrating when they change back and forth because you feel like you've got a sense of how they're doing it, and then they do it a different way. Basically, here's what's happening. When you plug headphones in to your Mac, your Mac notices the headphones are plugged in and are reasonably assuming that you don't want the speakers to work anymore. So it's hiding the existence of the speakers and saying, no, 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 there, there are no speakers here. It's just the headphones. In most programs, they're like, well, great. Take my audio and do whatever you want with it. And the Mac happily does this. QLab, though, allows you to specifically say, send this sound to this audio device. I don't care what else is going on, which is advantageous to us most of the time. But for you, M-D-W-I-C-H-O-S-F-F-F, -F, this is frustrating you because you're trying to work in two different contexts without making a bunch of settings changes. Jeremy says, thank you for the presentation. You are quite welcome, Jeremy. Thank you for joining us. So, MDYChoff, you can solve this problem two ways. One way is this, go to workspace settings, go to audio, and the simple way is Make one audio patch which uses system output as its selected device instead of specifically using MacBook Pro speakers or headphones or whatever. By setting it to system output, any cue which use the patch called Sys, any cue that uses that patch will follow the Mac OS settings. Uh, but where are we? Where are we? Oh, no, it's up here. If we open system preferences and go to sound, and go to output, whatever device is chosen here, QLab will use for this patch. If I change this, it changes in QLab. When you plug in your headphones, it will change here in QLab and you don't need two copies of your show. So, MD, hopefully this helps you. The other alternative is to create one for your speakers, one, one patch, one patch for your headphones. And when your headphones are plugged in, set this to your headphones. And then go to audition mode and say, whenever we audition audio, send it to my headphone patch. Now, when I hit go, it goes to my speaker patch. But when I hit audition go, it sends it to my headphones. I think the first way is easier. Um, but I wanted to pre present both options. Um, let me know, M-D-W-I-C-H-O-F-F, -F, if that adequately answers your question or addresses your issue. Tyler says, 
Is there any way Keylab can output video with Alpha? Yeah, Keylab outputs video with Alpha. You need a recipient that can accept Alpha. Um, so um, NDI supports Alpha channel. You could send two NDI outputs. Um, in fact, you yeah, if you you can send two NDI outputs, one with your background image and one with your foreground image that has Alpha. As long as your recipient knows how to handle Alpha channel, you're good to go. Um, I know the NDI tools package from NDI.tv has an NDI monitor app that is um, uh, not alpha aware, but Sienna tools has an NDI monitor app that is alpha aware. So that's your move. Um, MD, wonderful, solved one of my biggest frustrations. Great, I love solving your biggest frustration. That's great, rock and roll. Moving on for you with no frustration, hopefully. What else? What else? Thanks for audition audio headphone. Perfect idea. Great. Good. Good. Tom, thank you for taking time. Thank you for asking the questions. Thanks for joining us in the live stream. Really appreciate it. What else? What else? What else? Ask me any other questions, friends, or tell me any other ideas or pitch me any other topics. I talked about the manual a few times, but I didn't give you the link to the manual. QLab.tips, which is really a shortcut. For QLab, you know, it goes to the docs in QLab.app, but QLab.tips is the way to find the doc. And there is a downloadable PDF of the manual, which you can get from that link, um, but the built-in help links to the online version. Cameron, this may be off core functions, but would you offer an option to convert media to best format if it's not native already? We have thought about that. And um, because those file conversion tools that are out there exist, and many of them are cheap or free, and they're all really good, um, it's sort of, it's just been hard to, it's been hard to decide to definitely do it. If you go to a movie file and right click on it, down in the services menu, one of them is encode selected video files. And encode selected video files lets me choose Apple ProRes, preserve transparency, 4444, boom. So that, like, that feels really super duper easy. So maybe we don't need to add something to QLab. As um, Chris Ashworth, one of our, our, our lead developer, the original creator of QLab, as he's fond of saying is, Every place you add something to QLab is a place where one of the things that you one of the things you might add is a bug. And so we try to not add stuff that we don't have to add. Um, QLab Remote, two window list and active queue, any way to get it to work. The new version of QLab Remote supports multi-windowing, which is a newish feature in iOS. So you can now open two windows side by side on an iPad. And one can show a queue list, and the other can show active queues, or whatever you like. So yes, the answer, Krister, is that that is now possible. Um, thanks. Use Media Encoder, but in some situations and locations, it would be good to have QLab in an islanded configuration with no internet. I don't believe what I just showed with the right-click menu requires the internet. Um, you said you use Media Encoder. I do want to say one thing, which is we have seen time and again that Adobe Media Encoder uh, creates errors in files that no other encoder creates. Um, if you, even including using um, the export directly from um, Premiere. Adobe Premiere exports great. Adobe After Effects exports great. Adobe Media Encoder can cause errors. So Apple Compressor is the tool I recommend the highest. It costs 49 bucks. It supports every file format under the sun that QLab supports. It's fast and efficient, especially on Apple Silicon. It's incredibly fast. Um, if you are routinely working with video and routinely transcoding files, Apple Compressor is the way to go. Oh, look, Chris Ashworth said the same thing in the chat, but much more concisely. Well done. Johanna, what is the easiest way to start a video queue with a fade up? Do I have to make a list of fades for every video or is there a way to always fade up all videos? 
No, the way you fade a video cue is with a fade cue. So you create the video cue at opacity zero, then a fade cue to bring its opacity up to full. That is the way to fade in a video. You bet, Cameron. A pleasure. Um, we have now a few times, Johanna, had this request. Could there be some easy way to, autom to, to have a fade in built into a video cue? And it's something I'm dimly interested in figuring out how to pursue. Dimly was mostly a pun about opacity, but really um, what I mean is it is a convenience, certainly, to be able to fade videos in without a fade cue, but it is not like such an inconvenience to use a fade cue. So that's why it's something that we're thinking about, but not super important. What else, what else, what else? I'll say the little graph showing me how many concurrent viewers you folks are holding fast, and I, and I appreciate that. And I admire that. And our average view duration is almost half an hour, which is very good. Uh, Cameron, plus one for video queue fade as inbuilt parameter. Yeah, great. I believe you mentioned H2, Rich says, I believe you mentioned H.264 is not the best video format for shows. What do you recommend? The best tool for live playback of video in a theatrical type context is ProRes 422 Proxy. ProRes 422 Proxy sacrifices a small amount of sharpness and, uh, and a large file size in exchange for a low intensity processor overhead when playing. If ProRes proxy files don't look sharp enough for you, use ProRes 422LT, which is one step up in sharpness and also one step up in file size. Um, almost all ProRes 422LT files are sharp enough for anyone in a real production context. If you look at those files on your $10,000 Sony reference monitor, you will see their softness. But if you look at it through a projector, through a room with humidity in it, projected upon a cyclorama, which is a soft surface, you won't see the softness. So ProRes is the way. Um, HAP is also a highly recommended file format. Both of those are great. Um, Giles or Giles says, will there be a customizable in-app masking tool in the future integrated in the mapping soft? I don't know what in the mapping soft is. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about um, creating a masking tool in QLab and right now it's not on the table, but we hope to have it. Um, Jeremy says, is there a quick reference for what are the best sound, video, et cetera, type files in the manual um, under the entry for each type of queue is a discussion of which type of files are supported by that queue and why you might use one or the other. So that's the answer. Um, but yes, for video, ProRes 422, Proxy and LT, HAP are our best moving image formats without transparency. ProRes 4444 and HAP Alpha are our best moving image files with transparency. PNG, JPEG, and GIF for still images, AAFF, WAVE, and CAF for audio files. And that's the recommendation. Cameron, would you ever consider physical QLab license keys for rental houses? You can do it yourself right now. You can install a license onto a USB key and that key becomes a physical license um, with all the good and bad things that go with it, including losing it and then you lose your license forever. Um, so it's on the table. Um, we have elected not to explore supporting um, specific brands of license keys like iLock or Sentinel. Um, it's not out of the question that we might in the future, but that's not the route we've gone so far. Alex Pickup. Hi, I'm not sure if you answered my question. I might have missed it about main and backup in sync, either in hardware or in software, just running two Macs at the same time just for audio playback. Uh, we did discuss that, but in short, two Macs configured identically, both running to a sound system where you can mute the output of one or the other, and then an external controller driving both Macs to go, 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 go. You could sit there with your hand on two keyboards like this going go, go, go. That seems kind of annoying, um, but uh, an, a MIDI message or an OSC message from an external device, such as a stream deck plugged into a Raspberry Pi running companion, uh, sending a 
network message to both Macs saying go is the way. Um, uh, Brent, one of my colleagues, as talking to Johanna, that's great. Tom, on fading video, if you're doing a group of video files, start at 1% and fade to 10,000 to get them to fade in. Great, yes, thank you. Um, lots of folks asking and answering each other's questions, which I love. One of the things that makes me so happy about working on QLab is getting to be side by side with the great community of folks who use QLab. It really makes me delighted to see QLab folks helping each other out, which you do at a great deal. Martin asks, are there plans to integrate reverse playback for video and audio cues to play video back and forth instead of using loop? There are no plans right now. That's actually um, a much harder than it sounds like it might be. Um, but because so much of what QLab does is about perfectly and carefully synchronizing playback into the future uh, of without requiring you to set things up really cautiously, the idea of introducing reverse playback where time works backwards for one cue only is vexing. So it's not like I'll never say never, but um, that's an easy one for us to not do. Uh, and just if you need that, render a copy of your video backwards and then, you know, run it and run that end to end with your other forward video cue. Um, but I'm willing to be convinced, certainly, if you've got a compelling argument. Um, Cameron, if I purchase a rental license in GMT for a day, does it expire GMT or EST? Rental licenses are clocked against the local clock of the computer you're using when you buy the license. So where, wherever, whatever time zone your computer's in when you buy the license, that's the time zone the license belongs to. Matt, uh, Reynolds Design seconds Johanna's request for a fade in, fade out function in the time and loops tab that could be set to default in workspace settings. Um, Alex Pickup says, will this video be available afterwards so I can scrub? Yes. When I end the live stream, YouTube does some processing shtick on its own that I don't know, under, don't really know what it is or how long it takes. But eventually, when you come to our YouTube channel, this video that you're watching live now will be available as a playback um, pre-recorded video as though, as though it was pre-recorded all along. <clears throat> and I think if I don't touch anything, which I won't, the, the live chat actually scrolls along with, so you can actually see the conversation at the same time. I'm going to mute my mic for a second and cough really loudly. Thank you. I'm back. Eric, a feature request. Oh, an Eric Rosales feature request. Here we go. Are there any thoughts on implementing camera tracking, tracking an object in the camera feed? Let's say there's an object or video on somebody's face in real time, or how would you guys achieve this in real time? That is an enormous topic that I think exceeds the boundaries of this Q&A. But um, right now, we are not um, doing any kind of um, object tracking within QLab, and it's something that's interesting, but I think also something that sounds like a big challenge. Um, if it were me, I would build something in Max MSP and pipe video in and out uh, using Siphon. And uh, that's how I do it. Um, Johanna says, thanks to Brent. That's great. Rich says, not to beat a dead horse, but why is H.264 bad? Is it taxing on the processor? No, no, it's not, um, it's not like bad per se. It's just, um, it is built to, um, it is built to make a bunch of compromises in one direction so that it can get a bunch of advantages in the other direction. And Luke Norby says, this is my new favorite TV show. Hi, Luke. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Rich, okay, H.264 video. H.264 video is designed to solve the problem of streaming video over the internet where the internet connection could be flaky or not that fast in the first place and the most likely use of the video is start at the beginning and play through to the end, and then that's it. In order to make that advantageous, it has to make the file size really small, but timing can be compromised. When you press go in YouTube, it doesn't start instantaneously. But when you open the YouTube page, without you knowing it, the video might already be downloading onto your Mac. And then when you hit go, it starts playing, and it's filling in frames from the internet. And if playback 
exceeds frames per second, then you see the dreaded little loading spinner. And then more frames come in and that's like, okay, here I can go again. Oh no, ran out of frames, wait, spin. Now I can go again. If the internet connection is fast enough, the frames just fill into the buffer faster than it plays and you never notice. Killer. We also have a thing called, um, it's also a thing called a, a temporal codec, which means that instead of each frame of the video being fully encoded, it encodes one frame per second of the whole frame. But then in between, it just encodes the differences since the last frame. So frame one, here's all the pixels. Frame two, these pixels changed. Frame three, these pixels changed. If you skip ahead or skip back, unless you happen to land right on the one second mark, the two second mark, the three second mark or whatever, the video has to be decoded back from the previous keyframe. Cause a lot of extra work and um, and the, again, the fact of the codec being, the fact is that the codec is designed to not expect there to be a really strict time requirement. In QLab, in live theater, there is a very strict time requirement. Now means now. I press go, the thing should go now. I don't need to worry about streaming. I don't need to worry about the internet having a variable amount of latency or a variable amount of bandwidth. So all the things that H.264 is really good at mean nothing to me in the theater. But all the things that it's bad at, starting exactly when I say start, being able to be skipped ahead or back, paused on a perfectly frozen frame, all these things that I care about in a live performance context, it's not good at those things. It's prioritized something else. ProRes, because it's an editing codec, prioritizes immediate playback and deprioritizes having a small file size that could be streamed easy over the internet. I don't care. It's not streaming. It's right here on my hard disk right here. So. That's why we like ProRes. I hope that this is a good answer, and uh, I hope that this is a satisfying answer, let's say. Um, beep, beep, beep. Matt says, I've never tried to do this, but you say you've got a 4K NDI camera, but say you've got a 4K NDI camera, and you want to do virtual zooming by zooming in on a 1920 by 1080 portion of the 4K camera. Is this possible? Oh, yeah, sure, it's possible. Let's, um, let's, let's play. I'm going to make a camera cue. And instead of using your 4K camera, I'm just gonna use the webcam that you all see for me right now. So when I roll this camera, there I am in the audition window. But let's say, let's say that we don't want the full raster of this camera. Instead, we want a tight shot on me. So the easiest thing to do is to go to the geometry tab and use this new crop parameter. There we go. Okay, some spam has entered into the chat. Goodbye. And I hope that it has been gotten rid of now. Um, you know, good old spam. You can't be on the internet without um, without spam. So hopefully that spam is gone. Anyway, here we go. We've cropped in on the video. So now this crop is not animatable. I can reset it with the reset button here. But there is an animatable crop tool called Shutter. So I could create a fade queue, go to the video effects tab, and crop in on a queue. Mm -hmm. La -da 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 -da. Great, so now we start the queue, full screen, and now zoom in, Push. But that doesn't really feel like a zoom in, does it, right? Because it just feels like cropping in. But it can be made to feel like a zoom in if the original camera cue is about the same size. This is going to be very approximate, folks. And then the geometry also fades back up. So now the original camera cue is scaled down to 0.5 with no cropping, no shuttering. 
then the fade cue scales it up to one and shutters. Very approximate again. But you sort of get the picture, right? I hope you get the picture. Um, this is essentially a virtual zoom. Um, now, it doesn't really do the job of zooming because the parallax between me and the objects behind me doesn't change, but you get the picture. Matt says, even just cutting around the image, say you've got a two shot, you want to cut from one to the other, that sort of thing. Yep, totally. All doable. All doable using fade cues, camera cues, etc. So highly recommended. Um, great. And now I'm going to stop this camera because seeing two copies of my own face on my own screen is a little bit too much for me, just, just to be honest. What else? Other questions, comments, complaints, feelings, or suggestions? Notions, whimsies. Thank you, Chris Ashworth, for booting and deleting the commentary from the interloper. All right. Because of the lag in YouTube, it's impossible for me to say, like, last call, and then just immediately respond to last call. But I will say that at 4.25 p.m. my time, I am now entering the window of last call. And if, after a little while, there are no more questions, I will assume there to be no more questions. And of course, at that moment, Eric Rosales comes in. Another general question. Could you explain more in detail how timecode works? Could it synchronize timecode with video and arena and running cues in QLab so that the time I'm at in the show skips to that time in another application? That is not something that I can do at the very end of a long, um, at the, of a long Q and A. Time code is a complicated topic, but the short version uh, of the answer is yes to a limited extent. QLab now allows skipping around in time code to be followed along to. So, yes, basically. But we can talk more about it in detail another time. Krister says thanks for your time. Leaving uh, t evening time in Sweden. So long, tak, tak for coming, tak samiget. Did I do that right? I think I did that right, tak samiget. Um, my Swedish is very, very thin. Um, and um, would there ever be a hold at beginning time, hold at end? Oh, hold at beginning, similar to hold at end, yeah. So we have uh, a thing called hold at end, a video cue plays. And hold at end means keep the last frame visible as a still frame. Hold at beginning is a little bit more esoteric, um, but it can be achieved right now by starting the queue and immediately pausing the queue using a pause queue. So if I create this camera queue and I start it immediately followed by a pause inside the group, well, there we go. It's a really flattering still frame of me in the middle of a blink. But now I can unpause and it becomes live again. Cameron says, that's my current workflow. I'm looking for less cues. And here's where I will uh, taxa hemsk me get. Oh, I just learned a new word from Eric. I don't know what it means. Hemsk, hemsk, what does this mean? Um, Here's, here's what I want to ask the people who are asking for like the integrated fade in. I'm not saying that that's a bad idea at all, but I'm curious about the folks who are like seeking to make fewer cues just in and of itself. Is that something that you find sort of like satisfying internally? Like, ah, oh, it's better when it's fewer cues. Or is it like every cue is an opportunity to misprogram something? Or, or what is the motivation? Because for me, one cue per action means that I can open up my workspace and troubleshoot a problem or give my workspace to a colleague who doesn't know what I've done and they can follow what I've done as easily as possible. So for me, minimizing number of cues is not inherently virtuous. Matt says it's for speeding up the workflow and I encourage you to explore using hotkeys on script cues to help make your cues. For instance, to make a fade in for me, I have control I. When I type control I, a script runs, and now I have a fade cue that fades in the cue that I selected. 
so for me, again, in and of itself, fewer cues isn't necessarily virtuous. Um, some some nice thank yous in the chat. Very good. And Eric says, better stream than the first one. That's great. That's good. Using a different internet service provider today, so I'm glad to hear that it's working better. Um, Cameron says, it's a misprogramming thing. Change an operator making it simpler if it's not super good with QLab. Right. Some operators come from Playback Pro, so it's about making it simpler. Um, does that make sense? Yes, it does. And also, with respect, I don't think it should be our priority to make it easy for someone who's used to Playback Pro to get used to QLab. That's a little bit like saying, hey, Playback Pro does it in this way that maybe it's harder. But QLab should be able to do that too, um, just to make it easy for someone to come from Playback Pro. I'm not saying that Playback Pro is hard to use, although I think it is hard to use, but that's just this guy. Um, for us, we find the less we compare ourselves to specific other programs, the better we do at making features in QLab that feel like they belong to QLab, that feel in line with the other things that QLab already does. So I like the basic idea of what you're all saying, and I'm glad that you're saying it, and I'm trying to push back gently, not because I disagree or because I think you're wrong, but because I want to like push against and investigate the reasons behind the questions so that we can get to the root understanding so that when we add something to QLab, we make sure we add something that addresses the root, not just the surface level need. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. Um, it's digging, digging a little helps is really the short answer. Um, Mertz Madness says, uh, for me, it's a, be nice to have transition options. If you're working in video, transitions would be cool beyond a fade, wipes, pushes. Yes, Mertz Madness, I think that you're right. And that's interesting to me. And that's something I'm thinking about as well. That's something I'm thinking about. Um, some nice folks have said thanks for the demo. Um, all right, I'm opening the window of maybe no more questions again. So I'm going to sort of stall and spin my wheels for a little bit. And if what happens is no more questions, then I will end the live stream. But maybe some questions will come in within the lag of 20 seconds between when I said this and when it happens in reality for you all. Um, Johanna's talking about queue lists, multiple queue lists, and about keeping the main queue list clean that way. Sean says, thank you. And I say, thank you, Sean. It was a pleasure. All righty. As the questions seem to have dried up, I am going to say that that is the conclusion of this particular live stream. Friends, I appreciate the time that you gave to attend this live stream, and I appreciate the attention that you're paying to QLab 5. If you need help, support at figure53.com is the way to get it. If you are not already a member of our Google group, I encourage you to find it in Google Groups. It's a really great resource. People on that group are, there are middle school students on that group and there are uh, seasoned veteran, multiple Tony Award winning, multiple Olivier Award winning uh, designers on that group and everyone helps each other. Um, it's a great resource. Um, you can find us on Twitter at QLab app and at figure 53, you can find QLab on the web at QLab.app. And you can find me on QLab TV right here from time to time doing Q and A's like this and other tutorials. Thanks again and see you around.